Scriptable objects. If you're not using them in your project, you probably should. If you are using them, there might be even more ways to use them to make your project easier to maintain or make it easier to add features. Scriptable objects and Odin are a great combination, which is what I'll be looking at in the next video. So make sure you're subscribed and don't miss that video. In this video, I'm going to take a look at the basics of scriptable objects, how to create them, a few examples of how to use them, plus some pros and cons for using them in your projects. If you want to skip ahead or see something in particular, check out the timestamps in the description below. A scriptable object is just a script. It inherits from unityengine.object, just like a mono behavior does, but it's not a mono behavior. This means they won't receive most callbacks, such as start or update, but they can contain variables and functions. This also means that they can't be attached to a game object in the same way that a mono behavior or a component can be. They are objects, but they aren't game objects, and they don't have a transform. Rather, they live in your project folders, and this is where a lot of their power and usefulness comes from. Scriptable objects allow the separation of design data from runtime data. What does that mean? Let's say you want to add a new enemy to your game. If each enemy has their own script, then you'll need to create a new script with a lot of the same functionality as other enemies. Or if you have one large enemy script, this can lead to long chains of if statements or a bulky switch statement checking to see what type of enemy and then running code specific to that enemy. And that's okay, unless you want to add two enemies, or 10, or 100. It can get out of control in a hurry, making debugging hard and testing nearly impossible. Instead, if all the design data for the enemy, such as visuals, speed, damage, etc., are all contained in a single scriptable object, then all that needs to be created for a new enemy is a copy of that scriptable object. The values of the fields can then be adjusted for the new enemy. That data can then be loaded into a generic enemy object that then reads the data and adjusts settings as needed. And that can be a real game changer for how you build and create your games. So let's start with a simple example. To create a scriptable object, simply create a new c -sharp script, open in Visual Studio or whatever else you're using to edit your code, and change its inheritance from mono behavior to scriptable object. And that's it, you've got a scriptable object. But it's not terribly useful. Instances can be created through code using the command scriptable object dot create instance and then specifying the type. While this has its uses, I've found that creating a project asset is the more general use case and can offer the most benefits. And we can do this by adding the create asset menu attribute at the top of the script. This will allow a copy of the scriptable object to be created from the asset menu or by right clicking in the project folder. The file name of the newly created asset, as well as where in the asset menu it should show up, can be added as arguments to the attribute, like so. Subgroups can also be created by adding a forward slash after a group name, like this. We can then go into Unity and create a copy of our scriptable object. With that done, it's now time to add some functionality. Adding some basic fields will create a scriptable object that acts like a data container. I'll delete the start and update functions as they won't get called by Unity and I won't be needing them. For this example, I'll then add a field for the enemy name, a description for the enemy, a game object for the enemy model, as well as a few generic stats for each of the enemies. And with that done, more copies of the scriptable object can be created in Unity and the data populated for different enemy types. Now this is all well and good, but the data is just sitting in a project folder. We need something to handle the data. We need a script that will do something with that data. Now trying to keep things simple, but still showing the usefulness of this pattern, I've created an enemy controller script that has a field for the enemy data. This will allow the scriptable object to be dropped into the inspector so the data can be used by that script. I've also created a load enemy function that gets called from inside the start function. This function can do any number of things with the data, but in this case, I'll delete any and all children and replace them with the instance of the enemy model. I'm also gonna set the nav agent speed to the speed value in the data scriptable object. This approach can allow designers and developers to have one generic enemy prefab and simply load in different scriptable objects with different data and the player will see different enemies. I can demonstrate this by creating two empty objects, attaching the enemy controller script to both and then dragging in different enemy data scriptable objects. When I push play, I can see that the visuals for each enemy is different and matches the data in the scriptable object. 
And of course, other data can be used to differentiate the behaviors of the enemies as well. So what this has done is separate all the design data, such as the model, speed, and health, from the runtime data or the code that uses that data. It also means that all the data for a given enemy is in one place. It's not stored in a component that has a copy on each instance of the enemy. You change the properties on the scriptable object and it changes for all enemies in the scene and in every scene in your game. This is a huge step forward in keeping your code clean and making your project easy to maintain and expand. But let's dive a little bit deeper. Now imagine that you are creating a turn-based game and each enemy in your game has different actions for their turn. You could create an enemy manager that loops through all the enemies in the game. That's all well and good, but if each enemy has its own behavior, then the enemy manager might quickly get clogged with a chain of if statements, or if you're using an enum, you might have a complicated switch statement that calls different code based on different enemy types. This gets messy and can quickly become very hard to manage or debug. And this is where the keyword abstract comes in. Since scriptable objects are just normal classes, we can define an abstract scriptable object for a base enemy, and then all other enemy data scripts can inherit from that base. And what does this get us? Well, we can define abstract functions such as do turn. This function will be implemented on each and every enemy scriptable object, so this function can be called from the enemy manager regardless of what type of enemy it is and what type of behavior the enemy may have then each different enemy can define its own version of do turn in the scriptable object by overriding the base function. The enemy manager doesn't have to know or care about the enemy's behavior. The enemy takes care of its turn all by itself. This separation can make your code far easier to debug and it allows the creation of a new enemy type without having to change or modify the enemy manager. And once again, that's a game changer in how you design and how you create your games. We can still go one step further, but this time we're going to go a little bit more abstract and a little bit simpler. In my opinion, this next approach can go too far if you use too liberally, but in some cases it could be very, very useful. As we've seen, scriptable objects can be very simple data containers. These data containers may contain as little as one field, for example, a color. Now why would you bother to do this? Doesn't this just add more files to a project? Yes, it does but it also means that a given chunk of data is stored in just one place. So if you want to store a color for your UI and you want to access that color from many different elements or many different scenes, then all that needs to be done is to add a reference to the scriptable object and drop it in. No more copying hex codes from object to object or scene to scene. Change the color in one place in your project folders and all your scripts have access to that new value. This approach can be made even more versatile using Odin to create a custom inspector. This can allow a designer to switch back and forth between using the scriptable object or a typed in value. If you're interested in seeing how to do this with Odin, then leave a comment below and we'll add it to our list of video ideas. So hopefully those examples have piqued your interest and maybe given you some ideas of how to use scriptable objects in your projects. If you want to dive deeper into scriptable objects, there are great videos from Unity that look at these ideas and more. You can find links in the video description below. But before we finish, let's talk about some pros and cons of scriptable objects. So let's start with the pros. The scriptable object can be an asset and is accessible by any object in any scene, which makes for far easier design workflow. It also has the effect of decoupling the data from scripts. Multiple objects or scripts can access the data and those objects or scripts don't need to be aware of each other at all. Also, because of the way Unity serializes data, using scriptable objects can reduce the amount of data that needs to be serialized and can speed up the scene load times while you're working in the editor. And the last one, values don't get reset at runtime. So that means if you change the value on a scriptable object and you go out of play mode, they don't get changed. Now let's talk about the cons, or maybe not really cons, but just things you should be aware of when using scriptable objects in your scene. Now I just said that one of the pros is that the values don't get reset at runtime. I also think that's kind of one of the cons or one of the things you need to be aware of. I personally like to use scriptable objects for values such as max or min values rather than current values for this very reason. Scriptable objects are unity objects. That means that changing the scriptable object can result in loss of data. Rename a field and poof, your data's gone, it's disappeared, Unity's not gonna get it back. The last one here is not really a con, but it is a trap, especially for people new to Unity. 
scriptable objects can appear like a save solution. Changes in the scriptable object could easily cause loss of data. There are far better save solutions than scriptable objects. It's also worth noting that changes made to a scriptable object in a standalone build will not save, whereas in the editor they will save. And once again, this is giving the appearance of a save system and one of the reasons that I tend to use scriptable objects more for max and min values rather than current values. So there you go, we've talked about scriptable objects and three different ways you can use them in your projects. And stay tuned for our next video where we're gonna look at using Odin Inspector with these scriptable objects. Hopefully that was useful and interesting. And until next time, happy game designing.